if you have a purpose, it helps you find the, the power to get through things and have resilience. When I think of you two, the first word that comes to mind is resilience. What's key to being able to have highs, have lows, and be able to push through? Resilience is a result of a passionate desire to see a dream come true. I think of also the, the flip side of resilience, which is giving up. And giving up gives you nothing. Everyone has their own hardships. And to give up is to stop. You're going to be resilient because you have to take care of yourself. And then if you can add a dream on top of that, then your life opens up. I think people fear the word resilience because it indicates that failure is not an option, but that's actually not true. In fact, resilience is saying failure is real and it happens, but you jump back up. You get up off the floor, you give yourself time to cry and weep, and then you stop and you move forward. They say you learn so much from those moments. Was there a moment that you felt like I was down, but taught you the most to help you rise again? My big lesson was, I'm the person who creates my future, not the people around me who don't believe in me. Having a public failure that big freed me of fear. So I think a lot of times when people are afraid, they're worried about what others will think. But when you realize what others think really doesn't matter. If I fail, if I fail again, I'll fail. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to let this chorus change my life. Mm -hmm. At 76, I look at the amount of times I failed and the amount of times I've had successes. And they all had value. I'm a little smarter because of experience, so I can mitigate failure a bit. Both of you, I would say, were early adopters of certain ideas, and you kept through to make impact. I would say you were the first to come up with like the at-leisure idea. As a kid, I loved swimming. I still love it, but I swam all the time, and I would take my brother's sweatshirts and put them on when I got out of the water, because it absorbed the water, kept me warm. But in where you bought those sweatshirts were at Army-Navy stores and boys, men's and boys stores. So I bought a ton of gray sweatshirt fabric and I made some sweatshirt cover-ups. And then I thought, oh my God, an evening gown in sweatshirt fabric. Oh my God, a suit. Oh, jog pants. What about a um, jacket? And I had 36 pieces in gray sweats. And where did that come from? That's what an entrepreneur is. Same for you, Julie. I mean, like circular, the idea of circular fashion when you started The Real Real was not something everyone was talking about. I knew it and I never wavered. It just came to me when I was shopping with a girlfriend. I watched her buy consignment things in a beautiful store that wasn't a consignment store. And I said, this is it. This is what we should all be doing. But it was really how I was brought up. So that was sort of my sort of genesis. How do you connect with that voice? How do you make that space to be able to hear that voice that's authentic and follow through? I've learned to trust that if I have an intent, and it may not be a specific how to accomplish that intent, but if I have an intent, it will come to me. The answer will come to me. If I have a problem I need to solve, it'll come to me. Mine tend to come when I'm exercising, and I do that every day. I trust it. If I'm on a long walk, I will get answers. I will know things. For me, meditation is critical. I have a lot of quiet time where I may be sketching certain rituals that you create for yourself, but having a ritual that helps you sleep gives you the intention that this is, this is a cleansing process. It's a restorative process. And I take my mobile devices and put them very far away. I made a little sleeping bag for them. I'm serious. So that they're tucked away. Um, 
I think if we pay attention, there's information around us. I'm 76, but I look at the long game in my head. I decided I want to live to 120. Now, I may have a genetic disposition that doesn't allow that to happen, but I don't, that's not my problem. My goal is 120, so I think about what I do every day to reach it, and then I can have long-term plans and think about things in a different way. How do you stay ahead of the curve? If you're in the right job, it does feed your soul. And it does keep you going. And when things aren't, even when things aren't going that well, it still keeps you going. Mm -hmm. It's living in a creative space, whether it's like mine, which is um, arguably not like hers, but very similar in many ways, is, uh, is it's like a joy. It's almost like it's an honor. My purpose was to live a creative life. And then I had goals within that purpose. And um, so this is, this is the honor of, of my life to be actually living it and respecting it and not, not taking advantage of it, but really being appreciative of that. Does it like really hit you how impactful you've been in culture to the way that people are thinking and what they're doing? I think we're just getting started. And it really is about sustainability and getting people to think about recirculating. You can always buy new, but recirculating goods and buying things that actually do have longevity. We are making an impact. And I feel really good about being in the industry that we are because I know it's good for the planet. I know it's one of those things will leave things better than what it was before. And we are changing people's point of view. I agree with you about sustainability. I still am making the sleeping bag coat. The sleeping bag coat lasts in people's wardrobes for 30, 40 years. One of the most popular pieces of clothing I have right now is called the Diana dress. And it's um, a dress that I did in 1973. And I resurrected it um, again about five years ago. That dress in the design of it was meant to be timeless. I want something that can last forever for as long as that person wants to wear it and then they can pass it down, down to their daughters, give it to a friend. But or sell it on the real rail. Or sell yeah, it on the real rail, but much. not but not throw it away. And to me, that's a step in the right direction. So what's the next evolution of sustainability? I think we're in the awareness phase. So, wow. Yeah. What do you think is the greatest challenge in the industry right now? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a business. I do think that people won't change if laws don't force them to change. So it comes down to having the right laws in place to affect change. But those laws cannot stop the industry. You don't want to kill an industry while you're trying to save the planet because then no one wins. And it won't work. It just won't work. My dream has been, why can't we create towns built around manufacturing, train the people, make green homes, make a green city that is a manufacturing city, teach people a trade, have a medical center, have a school, have education, everything that's green and healthy and build towns like this. So this is my dream. You don't seem defined by your gender, either one of you. I am curious to hear from you what your advice would be to women in terms of carving their space. I had some incredible men who helped me, supported me, gave me great advice. Maybe they mansplained, and they still do. <laughs> Maybe they did. However they delivered the information, I grabbed it. Did I have some horrible experiences? Yeah, I have a list, a horrendous list a mile long. But each and every one of them served me. How do you both feel about 
ageism. Well, I mean, it's one of the things I've always thought was amusing, and especially in business reporting, they always put me in my age. I'm like, I don't see that with men, which I think is somewhat interesting. But one thing's true, if you're aging and you understand yourself more, everything gets better because you can let go of things. See, I aging um, with power is my topic du jour, part of my purpose also in service to talk about this and to talk about my age all the time. I mentioned it probably twice today um, on purpose because 76 is a big deal. I'm proud of it. I met my soulmate at 65. If I wanted to enjoy longevity, I would have to practice self-love. And aging must be respected. What I know now, I never would change my age for your age. I don't want to be your age. I did that. It was a little painful. It was a little happy. I don't want to do it again. I'm not going back there. But I'm looking forward to how I manifest the rest of my life. And talking about age with pride, we can share and help everyone understand and be comfortable in the possibilities of age. What's the best part of 76? I have lots of fun projects that I want to do. I'm very comfortable in my body. I feel sensual, feminine, sexual. I don't feel like I'm being denied anything. I feel I work out at Equinox with people half my age, and I'm doing pretty good there. And they're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm good. So I am loving the power of this time in my life. Um, I'm comfortable with my lines. I'm comfortable with what's going on because I feel really good here. I love aging with power. I think that, you know, there's certain things you can control in life. Like you control, you know, your health to some degree. You can control what you put in your body, control exercise. But you look like it's a gift to be alive. It's a gift to have all this knowledge. It's a gift to have taken that journey. I think fixating on age is a is a bad thing because then you're going to be stuck in someone else's metaphor for life. Yeah, I think the other uh, other people's perception of age is is sort of I mean it's just not realistic anymore. And so all of that needs to be talked about more and the phrase aging gracefully I find old fashioned. I do too. Aging with power means you're active and you're and you're participating and you're you're creating a power. But being aged out is offensive. And it's 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 a being aged out of the dating market is a perfect example. Like, are you kidding me? This is manufactured. This is not real. So our internal community has a few questions for you. The first one being what is the highlight of your career so far? Um, I think it's yet to come. Well, I've had a few good moments. So, uh, you know, <laughs> um, and one of them was definitely the IPO. But I honestly think the best is yet to come too. But I don't want to negate that moment because it was a goal I thought was critical for the company. And I'm just like, I'm just so excited to be part, to be part of the company. How do you support others who are maybe they need a powerful woman like you to support them? What does that look like? First of all, we do have the company. So we, you know, try to provide career opportunities for people. The only way you provide career opportunities, you keep growing. The company has to grow. Um, Second way is scholarships. So I have scholarships at my alma mater at Purdue. I have scholarships at uh, Parsons. I have scholarships at the um, Art Institute of San Francisco, but that that's that's what allyship looks like to me. It's putting money and time to help others. 
One of the things I always recommend is that they ask whoever they admire if they could speak with them or ask a question because you would never say no. I would never say no. no. Um, And uh, one of the things I learned when I was trying to figure business out with I that person seems to be doing things really well um I wonder if they would give me five minutes on the phone or a half hour it's a big part of always being accessible to whoever needs you I too have a lot of women in my company and taking the time to either have coffee with them go for a walk do something at that moment where you can really make a big change in their productivity, their personal growth, and um, their potential. What keeps you going on the tough days? Keeping it in perspective that it's like something better will happen. Total agreement. The bad day ends and the good day will begin and you have to just get through it. I can't thank you both enough for spending this time with me. 